Hello and welcome to the Tech Lunch Podcast, where we encourage our listeners to learn something new about tech every week. This can range from learning about new and exciting te- applications to the advancements in coding and technology. If you are always learning, you will always be a step above the rest. Take the time during lunch or during a break to listen and learn, kind of like a lunch and learn, but for the years. This podcast will open the listeners' ears to new and exciting technologies they may have not been purviewed to in the past. These topics will range from manufacturing technologies to data collection technologies and everything in between. Hello, I'm Nick. Hello, I'm Ed. All right, and this week we're going to go over just a quick snack episode, and we're going to you know talk about the the world of uh, virtualization. You know, we're talking from like the ESXi side of the house. If you really want a bare metal virtual installation, or to like your VMware players or your virtual boxes that runs natively on a Windows machine or on a uh, Apple device, depending on how you look at it, you know that can also include boot camping. So when we're thinking about, you know, um, virtualization, you know, what are you thinking about, Ed? So when I think about virtualization, the first thing that comes to mind is if I took a snapshot of a client out on the floor, I could take that snapshot, put it into a virtual machine, and in that virtual machine, I could try different um, combinations of settings, or I could try to run... Um, different versions of software and kind of get an idea of what would happen if I ran those things in the real world. So it's kind of like a test run environment. Yeah. And the thing is, if you think about it, you know, when you're talking about like ESXi and you're talking about, if we're talking from a hard server install approach, you'd install ESXi first. And then from there you go on the application interface and install your OVF file which is your snapshot from the, the shop for that you took. At that same point, I can go in there and I can start setting up, you know, things called virtual switches, virtual NICs, and all of that, and kind of segregate that data to only work for that one application, depending on how I looked at it. Now, if you really want to have something where it's, I want to troubleshoot on the fly, you can install that virtual box on your machine. So, say if I want to do migration, say if I had a... Windows XP machine that I need to migrate to a Windows 10 machine. Well, also, by the way, this is also known as teleportation. Say if I wanted to take these uh, this machine and put it into another machine, I could move it into this machine without physically causing any interruption to the host. And what that would do, that would give me the opportunity to see what problems I would run into before I actually tried to take a Windows 7 uh, application and try to implement that on a Windows 10 uh, platform. Yeah, that's correct. And the other thing is, you know, what you can think about and how everybody can try it at this point is you can download an OVF file from a Linux distro, you know, Ubuntu, Fedora, or whatever, and load it into VirtualBox to learn visualization or virtualization, sorry. And also, you can load into VMware Player to learn from that side of the house, or you can take an old a old tower PC, load ESXi on it, and throw a bunch of VMs at it and learn. And then uh, you you can think about it a different way. What if I needed to run something in a container? I wanted to run something, say malware analysis, and I wanted that to stay inside of this container, and you could also do this in a virtual machine, but say I wanted to keep it in a container. I wanted it as a container so that I can do some uh, testing and uh, actually find out how this malware is working. But I wanted to keep it in a way so that anybody could access it inside of this container. And I didn't have to worry about setting up this VM for each machine. I could put this in a container, use this container to uh, keep everything in one place, and then I can look at how it interacts inside of this container and say, oh, okay, here's the way it works. Here's the way we can prevent it from doing what it's trying to do. Now you mentioned containers. You know, to me, that kind of rotates back to everybody's new favorite buzzword called Docker. Um, You have Docker containers. You can go get them from, you know, Docker Hub. If you really want to play with Docker, you can install Docker Desktop, run some Dockers at Docker Hub and give it a whirl. 
Um, that is the new, you know, new hotness, you know, if you want to say outside the, 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 uh, you know, visualization world, the virtualization world is the fact that I am going to use a Docker machine because I can easily blow it away and restart. Or I can set it up that after a certain amount of time, blow away and restart again, depending on how you looked at it. And it can run on any type of host. You know, if you're talking about bare bones virtualization, you're talking about, you know, the um, Oracle Hyper-V, you're talking Windows Hyper-V from a Windows server standpoint or a Windows 10 machine, or you're talking about ESXi, you know, whatever it's at now, I think it's like 7.1 or 7.2. But, you know, there's different layers. Depending on what you want to do with it, it depends on what it's looking at. And you can take that data, consolidate it into one little machine. You can test on that and blow it away as many times as you want to and reload the same snapshot over and over and over again until you get the kind of the production image you want. And then take that and load that to a machine. And it's, it's ironic that you say uh, containers or uh, container in a virtualized uh, platform. The thing about having... Um, something isolated say for example i had a new application and this new application i was not sure if i had apis that would break the system or i was not sure if this driver that i created would cause some um interference with another uh device or if i had, i would have irq problems or whatever i could simulate all these things before i went to the production environment yeah and at least i would have an ideal and then this is inexpensive as opposed to having hardware that I'd have to purchase, load these uh, uh, drivers, and put an operating system on, have a license. All these things wouldn't be necessary. I could do all this in a virtual environment um, and not have to have this expensive hardware. And what it would do is it would allow me to do testing, and then I could proof out or come up with a proof of concept that, hey, this driver is fine. Or, hey, this API that we just wrote is great. Yep. No problem. And the thing is, if you're thinking about, you know, a cheap way or inexpensive way to learn virtualization and learn how some of this stuff works, you got Amazon. Amazon Web Services, or AWS for that matter, for, you know, the nickname for you'll hear the buzzword. You have something called the EC2 instance, where you can run a Linux container as much as you want to for free for 12 months. You have the ability to go in there and play with it. And, you know, I'm not, you know, saying go out and, you know, play with AWS if you don't want to, you know, because there's definitely nothing there. But, you know, the idea of it is you can either learn cloud computing, which is virtualized, or you can learn hardware virtualization, or you can learn it from your laptop. Virtualization, getting into it is easy. Hard servers that people know and love, some people are diehards about it, where they have, you know, ver they have Windows, Windows Server 2018 running on this hard machine, that's going away. We're, you'll, ne you'll probably never see those loaded again like that, you know, for a very long time. And in the same process, you can also virtualize your storage in the grand scheme of things, letting things expand and contract as users use data or they don't use data. And that is the great thing is not only, not only do we have AWS, we have Azure. Yeah. Um, I would say that one of the things that I really see a benefit or a, this is the thing that you can use. How many times have someone said, do not cut off that machine. You cut off that machine, it'll break. Well, what if I wanted to simulate that and have fire drills so that I can have my IT staff able to respond when that machine actually goes into a condition where it's powered off or what if i had some um industrial control system that's out on the shop floor and i said don't cut it off don't cut it off because you're going to have a problem what if i could virtualize that and i could take the guys and we could power it down and figure out hey this is how you recover yeah what we said that you should never power down was because we didn't understand how it worked we didn't understand the wizard behind the curtain yeah. Once you understand what the wizard is doing behind the curtain, you are the wizard. Virtualize your training environment. You know, that's the best way to do it. Like you said, do the fire drills. And it's the great way of doing and training for disaster recovery. 
if you think about it, you can also, you know, visualize, virtualize um, uh, databases and take all that data, transform it and send it someplace else. You know, and the same thing with like MQTT clients, like we talked about prior, the clients and their hosts can all be a virtual machine running on a Windows, bo- on, a, on a Linux box someplace for very little resource usage. And then another thing I, I would say is, here's another, here's another caveat. What if I could take and hold a whole assembly line, put this in a virtual environment and say, hey, what would happen if we did this? Just like the what if comics we used to read. What if this POC failed? Yep. How could we recover? What if this client failed? How could we recover? What is the best course for recovery? We could do these things. Like Nick said, disaster recovery. We could do tabletop exercise virtually and actually know what to do in these situations. Not just from the IT side, from the OT side, all the way up to management, all the way up to senior management. We could have all these things virtualized as exercises. And everybody would know how to react. And we're only doing it in a virtual environment so we can blow it away if something happens and do another virtual environment. Yeah. And it's a great way to catch your steps. You know, train, 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 plan, 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 and pray something doesn't happen. You know, I'd rather be prepared for something and it never happen than, you know, pretty much with a proverbial you call it my pants down. Because, you know, I had the, I had the resources there, but I never took advantage of it. And you and another possibility could be, hey, we're running at eighty percent capacity. What happens if we run beyond eighty five percent? What if we could get to ninety percent? I could do that in a virtual environment with no impact to to production and no risk. Right, stress testing. You know, stress in the systems, and you can can do. You know, that's part of your software testing package is stressing the system out until it fails. You want it to fail in a virtual environment, in an environment where it can be easily recovered instead of having to do it when money is on the line. And say you have a sister company somewhere that's running really efficient. You can take a image from those system companies, put it into a virtual environment and see what they're doing right. Yep. And then you don't have to go thousands of miles or get on a plane or have them fly thousands of miles. I can take that image and with that image, I can put it into a virtual environment and say, Oh, that's what they're doing. Yeah. And the same process, you're saving money. You're not paying for, you know, big software packages or big hardware packages. You know, if you put it in the cloud and cloud computing and stuff like that in the virtual environment that is the cloud or on virtual servers, you have sent at the house, you can, or, or at the office, you can run old equipment with newer loads on it. If you virtualize it, and you can also bring artificial intelligence into it. You can bring in custom APIs. You can bring in scripts. You can do all these things inside of a virtual environment and say, yo, you know what? We've hit on something here. We figured out a way to not only test the system, we figured out a way to also make this the best system we ever had. Right. And that's kind of, you know, how, we're, how we have to look at it. And I think that's kind of where, you know, we look at it in the future. And I think that's, you know, the way we're headed. You know, how can I stress a system? How can I build a system virtually to run more efficient, to let more users kind of dive into it and, you know, always have a constant uptime because you always want your constant uptime to be 100%. That and virtual servers are, and virtual applications are so much easier to fail over in case of, in case of main failure where you, don't, where you have continuation of service. And then here's another thing. Like, think about commissioning. Yeah. The world of commissioning for the ICS environment has changed. Most suppliers, whether it's robotics, whether it's POCs, SCADA systems, they do this in a virtual environment first. They virtually commission this stuff first. Then they get it to about 80%. They take and say, hey, this is what I saw. These are the things I saw wrong in the virtualization. They correct those. They take the actual uh, ideals they had, commission it, and then they've taken about 75% of the time out because you virtually commissioned most of the project. And it's just 20%, which is cleanup. Yeah, exactly. 
And that's something, you know, we'll definitely be hitting on later, you know, but, you know, from that standpoint, that is, you know, time is money, money is time. And that saves you money in the long run. And uh, I would say if you're not doing virtualization, please take this opportunity to take some of the things we said today. Go out and get VirtualBox. It's free. Download it. Get you a free evaluation copy of something from Windows or get you a feed, a free distro from Linux. Or just take an image from your shop floor or take an image from your IT department or take an image from your server and throw it into VirtualBox box and see what it does play yeah, around with it exactly and i think that's where we're going to leave you for the day and you know we're going to leave you with the charge you know go out learn something learn this vir the the uh virtualization play with it get involved with it have fun with it learn docker learn the cloud computing if you really want to get into that and you know kind of see how you can streamline your processes going forward so we leave you with that. We hope you're constantly learning something, and we'll catch you around next time. Thank you for listening to the Tech at Lunch podcast, where we hope you learned something about tech during your break or during your lunchtime. If you did, please give us a follow to prevent missing future episodes. If you have any ideas or something you want to hear or learn about, please send us a show idea to podcast at vulcanora.com. Hope you have a good rest of the day and continue learning.